Hello everybody, welcome back to Witch Fix. Today we're taking a long overdue look at the remake of the Charmed series, uh, starting with the pilot. I'm not going to do it on an episode by episode basis, but I thought uh, the pilot is going to show us a lot about what this show is going to be, how it's going to be different, so I'll look at that and do its own episode before I launch into the rest of the first series. Now, way, way, way back in the day, I was a very keen Charmed fan. I did stop watching about, I think, two seasons before the end, because frankly, it did become a little bit ridiculous. You know, you had like a good strong start and then the lore just kept expanding and then you had like magic school and Billy appearing and a load of other stuff that I really wasn't into. But for the Shan Doherty years and then a bit into Rose McGowan's stint on the show, I was a real big fan. I enjoyed that show muchly because it had a lot of witchcraft in it and although Buffy the Vampire Slayer was kind of my like more favourite show. Obviously it wasn't wholly about witches so Charmed kind of had the edge on that. So when I heard that they were remaking this um, and that the remake would come out in 2018 I was cautiously optimistic. Although it did seem like there was a lot that could go wrong and debatably a lot which has. So um, we're gonna launch into it now. Just want to preface the discussion in this episode because I will be talking about consent and rape and various other feminist topics because they are blatantly threaded through the pilot episode. There is nothing too graphic and I don't describe scenes uh, of any of those because they do not occur in the pilot episode but if the discussion of the topic is going to upset you I encourage you to go and listen to a different episode and to stop listening to this one now. To start off, I'm aware there's some controversy around the show because basically the family's meant to be like Afro-Latina and only one of the actresses that they hired actually is, which is just a whole mess of a thing, uh, which is definitely not the fault of the actresses, but more the fault of the, the creators of the show. Um, but there we go. That's unfortunate. Unfortunately, we're already going into a third series, which has now been confirmed. So it's not like that can really be changed now. But at the same time, I think there needs to be having a conversation about like, maybe we should have people play the people that they are. And this extends to all varieties of things like stop casting cis people as trans people. Maybe we should just stop doing things like that. But anywho, uh, to get into the actual like fictional world of, of the, the Charmed Ones and what has changed, not much. Um, like most of the basic building blocks are still there. You got sisters, you got a cool house, you got a magic book, white lighters, demons, innocence, witchcraft. It, it's all still in there. But some of it has been moved around a little bit. And most of my criticism comes from, ironically, things that have stayed the same. And also the fact that this is apparently meant to be a feminist remake of Charmed. So I think a lot of the original actresses would say that that was a little bit offensive, saying that you could make a feminist version of Charmed as if Charmed wasn't already feminist. Because it is essentially at the end of the day about, you know, women kicking butt and taking names and being witches, which is a pretty feminist thing in itself. Unfortunately, judging by the pilot, whoever's writing this series mistook feminist for preachy because they seem to have abandoned all subtext and are just saying feminist things as if that's what people want to watch. So it seems to have kind of gone the same way as the the new Sabrina series, uh, which was a bit like teeth grittingly woke is, is how I'm going to put that, uh, which I didn't enjoy. But I'm going to take you through the plot of episode one and comment on it as we go through. So first up, we're introduced to Maggie and Mel. Uh, these are oh, respectively the sort of Phoebe younger sister character and the Piper middle sister character. Uh, Maggie is a young college student. She wants to go out to like sorority parties and be popular and all that stuff. And Mel is a preachy gender studies cliche of a feminist. Um, basically always talking about toxic masculinity, consent, all this sort of stuff, which can definitely be a thing that she can talk about. But I feel like she is just Tumblr posts that they put in some shoes and claimed was a person. It's a little grating to start out with. They both live at home in a house that looks a lot like the original Charmed House, but also slightly different, uh, with their mum, who is alive. So that's already quite different. She won't be that way for long, but 
we'll enjoy her while she's there. Uh, their mum is angrily on the phone talking about a professor who is contesting his suspension over something that happened to a girl called Angela Wu, who I thought was dead, but it turns out is just in a coma. Uh, so something's happened there and he's been suspended. Obviously, given everything that Mel says, it's kind of apparent that this is to do with some sort of sexual harassment. And also their mum is a gender studies professor, which made me laugh. And uh, she says that the first line that you hear of the show is the mum saying, this is not a witch hunt. And then they continue to beat the shit out of the phrase witch hunt until it loses all meaning. The show does do a good job of setting up the mother daughter and sibling relationships between Maggie and Mel and their mum um, before um, Maggie goes off to a rush party or a sorority party and Mel goes out on a date. It is revealed that Mel is a lesbian to the surprise of no one because I mean if you're gonna have an angry militant feminist she's probably got to be a lesbian. That's how that works she said lesbianally but yeah so they go out for the for the evening and then their mum is attacked by some CGI bird which it doesn't look great. The CGI does not look great at all and it really made me miss the days of, of Original Charmed when so much was done with just like practical effects and just like puffs of smoke and, and tiny explosions and it just looked really effective and still kind of looks good today because it didn't rely on CGI that much. Lessons could be learned here. Uh, but she's attacked by some CGI birds. She then goes upstairs to try and do a spell, but is interrupted uh, by some fog and some more birds, which come in through the window. We then see uh, Maggie at the sorority party and Mel on her date. But Mel gets a text, and I'm assuming Maggie did too, from their mum saying that they should come home right now. It's an emergency. So when Maggie doesn't pick up, Mel goes to the party to like physically get her. But when they arrive at the house, it's to find everything is freezing cold. And there are crows there and their mum has plummeted out of the top story window uh, from the attic and is dead. So that's obviously pretty harrowing. And then we get into a, a jump several months forward to, I guess, like present day for the series. I thought the opening was quite atmospheric. It was definitely a lot cooler than just, I think, the original pilot of Charmed, which is just their grandmother has died. It added a little bit more drama, a little bit more intrigue, because now they have a reason to cooperate together to try and find out what happened to their mum. We then meet the third in our cast of Charmed Ones, who is Macy. She is older than previous older sibling Mel, so I guess sort of the prue of the group, one might say. Um, but she's being introduced with this guy who she's wandering around with, who might be a sort of love interest in the future, not sure. But he's walking around this town, which is no longer San Francisco. It is like Hilltop or Hilltown. He refers to it as Helltown, which is stupid. Uh, that's all I have to say about that. But she's looking for a place to live near campus, sees the sister's house and has like a reaction to it, which we'll find out about later. We also find that in the intervening months uh, since their mother's death, the Professor Thane, who was the one who was suspended, has now been reinstated and works in like the science department, uh, which is where Macy is going to be working. And he is very creepy. We're then introduced to Mel three months after this incident, who has become a lot more angrier and, if even possible, more feminist. She is one Birkenstock away from just being Tumblr. But uh, she's having a row with the new women's studies professor, who is a white cis man, and she's not standing for it. To be honest, that also seems like a weird hiring decision for the university, but, you know, she, she seems very cross about it at him for some reason. It's not like he hired himself. But this is Harry and he is their white lighter. And I know this because I watched a trailer. She doesn't know it yet, which I guess is why it's weird that he's seen following her. But he is their new white lighter and they've kind of changed the role of white lighters. And this also annoyed me in that now the white lighter isn't just like a guide who pops in and heals people. He seems to be acting as their Giles and telling them what to do. Which, um, debatably, Leo did a little bit of that in the original series, you know, when he wasn't pretending to be a handyman. God love him. But I feel like he's taken on a little bit more of a preachy authoritarian role. It might just be because he's British and that's just how British people come across next to Americans. Sorry about it, but it was a little weird. 
Mel then does the first thing I actually liked her for, which is she gets into kind of an argument when she's stapling up Time's Up posters outside because I'm being hit over the head with how feminist this is. Um, a guy starts arguing with her about how she shouldn't be putting them up because it's a witch hunt. But then he says some very mean things about her dead mother and she punches him in the nose, which is fair and definitely something that you can get unreasonably angry about. Mel is convinced that there's some sort of conspiracy because Angela, who's the girl in the coma, went into a coma in suspicious circumstances after coming forward about Professor Thane. And then her mother, who called for his suspension and I guess also firing him, uh, then got murdered. So it seems like there's some sort of conspiracy going on and Mel is very sold on that. One of the cops who's investigating the crime, I guess, is her now ex-girlfriend. So clearly their relationship didn't weather that particular storm. Mel and Maggie then have a fight about how uh, Maggie wants to join a sorority and move into a sorority house because she doesn't want to live at home with Mel. Um, which, fair, Mel seems like kind of a buzzkill. Macy then arrives, and this is the first time we hear her name, is when she introduces herself on the doorstep. Turns out the reason she was so enamoured of their house when she saw it is because she has a picture of her outside it as a kid with the woman who is all of their mothers. So it's pretty self-explanatory. She declares that she must be their sister, and then there's an explosion and all the lights go out because magic which is no less dumb than the bit with the chandelier that they kept putting in charmed so i'll give them a pass on that they then have a fight about macy's sudden appearance mel says that she must be after money because mel is very angry and mistrustful in the wake of her mother's death which i understand and this is actually sort of the point where i started warming to mel as a character because from this point on she is less annoying somehow i don't know why uh, macy has apparently been told that her mother died when she was two so now that's another mystery that's going to come out throughout the series is why on earth her mum would just abandon her. So we'll find out about that. Later on she's at a bar talking to her guy friend about all this. I, I don't know his name and I don't know if they ever said his name but Macy's guy friend. And while in an emotional state she makes a beer bottle fly across the bar and smash into a wall. So obviously she's got the telekinesis. Maggie is still rushing this same sorority and they get a truly awful speech worthy of being in a Pitch Perfect movie about how Kappa is woke because they do a lot of charity work, which is annoying. And I feel like this would be a perfect moment because it's at this moment that Maggie gets the power of uh, reading minds. As soon as she touches someone, she can read like their top layer of internal monologue. So... So far, it's been very bludgeoning you over the head with all this like feminism stuff. This would be the perfect time to reveal something in a subtextual way. Like maybe they only want Maggie in the sorority as like a diversity thing. And then she can be annoyed at them about that. Or maybe it's something she's thinking anti-feminist against Angela, the girl in the coma, because apparently the charity work they're doing is for her. They miss a lot of opportunities to weave stuff in naturally in favour of just shouting it in your face. There's a lot of nuance that they just didn't bother with in, in making this. They just had people say, consent is important. So there. Which is actually a moment in the, in the series when uh, originally Mel goes to get Maggie from the sorority party. She causes a scene to make Maggie leave by just grabbing random women who are making out with guys and telling them about consent. Why? Because feminists want to ruin people's fun? I, I don't get it. But there we go. And that, um, annoyingly, is a plot point later. I wish I was kidding. Mel then meets her girlfriend or ex-girlfriend for coffee and accidentally starts intermittently freezing the conversation, uh, which starts with someone accidentally nearly tipping over a cafeteria of coffee, but then just continues to freeze things accidentally with no real reason. The freezing effect looks pretty good. Then again, it always did, even back in like original Charmed days. So I'm not necessarily giving them props for that, but it, it still looks okay. She then leaves the coffee shop and this was actually my first genuine laugh because I feel like Charmed was one of those dramedy series like Buffy where there were always these comedy moments. This is the first one that made me laugh. So she leaves, gets kind of yoinked to one side as if being kidnapped and then wakes up tied to a chair in the attic of the witch house with her two sisters and Harry's there like, hi guys! And they all scream immediately. Uh, and it's just quite funny. <laughs> He's just like, I'm a woman studies professor, but I decided to kidnap you all and tie you to chairs. 
and I'm really sorry about it. <laughs> it just cracked me up. But he gives them this spiel about how they're witches. There's a lot of exposition. They keep interrupting him to ask questions, which doesn't make it less exposition, but does create some sort of like fun comedy feeling to it. So that's kind of fun. One of the big changes in White Lighters, apparently, is that they can now do magic because he snaps his fingers and the ropes that are tying them to the chairs disappear. Which is interesting. Like, apparently they've just changed what that is. Like, he's still a dead guy because we're told that he died in, like, the 1950s. But now he can also do magic that isn't just disappearing and healing people. So that's weird. Speaking of disappearing, I hate the effect that they've done for that. Like, the original White Lighter effect was fine. But now he kind of pings into a little kind of rubberized ball of weird strands that kind of loop in and out and then he disappears. He looks like a Looney Tunes character. I don't like it. He gives some rationale behind all their powers, like how uh, Maggie is super sensitive to public opinion and very self-conscious, so that's why she can now read minds. And um, Mel is a control freak, so now she can freeze time, which is basically what the story behind their original powers was, except obviously Phoebe could see the future because she never thought about the future. They always seem to stumble on explaining the telekinesis power, and he explains it by, I guess, big brain makes smart, so move stuff with brain? I don't know. So they still haven't come up with a reason for that. They get the spiel about how their powers were bound when they were children, and their mum was trying to reverse it when she was, you know, murdered. So it's confirmed that she has been murdered. He then reads to them from the Book of Shadows, which straight up does not look as cool as the original one. Uh, but he then proceeds to insist that Trump being president was the first sign of the apocalypse. I guess looking for more of those woke points. Uh, and then he gets to the final sign, which is oh, the blossoming of death will signal the rise of the source of all evil. So again, that's an original charmed thing of the source, although he was kind of just a weird guy. So it'll be interesting to see if they do anything different with it this time. He then says that they have 48 hours to decide if they want to remain witches and if they decide as a group not to then their minds will be erased of everything that's happened and their powers will be I guess locked up again uh, and that nothing will come and get them and he says this is because witches are pro-choice. So I am again being smacked with a big rubber squeaky mallet that says feminism when it hits you in the face. Straight away Maggie is very anti them being witches because she doesn't want to be turned into a smoothie by a demon. Uh, Mel is immediately pro because she's like, powerful women throughout history have been called witches all the time. Yo, we should definitely be witches now because time's up and various other things that are probably already memes on Instagram. Macy is the kind of swing vote between them because she just flat out doesn't believe that witchcraft is a thing, even though she can move stuff with her mind. So she's going to need to use that big brain of hers to remember things that have just happened to her. Obviously now comes peril, because we need some peril, uh, and this is in the form of Maggie going to a party via some spooky woods, finding a golden retriever or yellow Labrador, I can't remember, but it growls and has green glowing fangs and then it chases her back into the house. Unfortunately, since she left, Mel has uh, invited her ex-girlfriend over and they are reconciling upstairs. Once Maggie arrives home covered in green goo and talking about demon dogs, Macy is summoned to analyse the green goo with what looked like a magnifying glass taped to a smartphone but can't possibly have been. She says that the goo is something to do with sulfuric acid and then it can be neutralised with baking soda. So they're going to go kill a demon with baking soda, which is dumb. This is something you would expect to see in like a Goosebumps episode, except Goosebumps would never stoop this low. I really didn't care for this. I realise that they're trying to show that she has like a scientific background and wants to analyse things, but I feel like there was a better way than doing this. Even if she'd have said, look, the thing leaves traces of sulfuric acid so maybe we can use like litmus paper or something to identify the touch of the person who is also possessed because apparently this demon dog has to have a possessed owner that's how that works but yeah the baking soda thing was stupid and i hated it they ask maggie who knew she was going to cut through the creepy woods to get to the party and she says that only the leader of the kappa sorority knew that she was going to the party which is dumb, because she got a text while she was in the spooky woods from her ex, Brian, 
who knew she was going to the spooky woods, so it's obviously Brian. They continue to believe that it is the leader of the Kappas, and they all go to the um, Kappa sorority house after Maggie is kidnapped again and taken there by, I guess, the sorority. My question is, if they're not evil, why would they put a bag over her head and then, I'm presuming, ignore her screaming for, like, the 45-minute car ride back to the university? I mean, I get that it's hazing, but it seems extreme. <laughs> so there we go. She's at the party and she gets taken into a room by Brian, who she doesn't suspect is evil. And then he goes to kiss her and she reads his thoughts, realising that he's a demon. And she says, oh, actually, no, I don't want to kiss. And he's like, you already said yes. And she's like, consent means I can change my mind at any time. Which, don't get me wrong, is true. But it's still stupid for someone to say in a dramatic situation like this. And again, I'm being walloped with the feminism mallet. Anyway, they throw a box of arm and hammer over him and he shakes his head around really fast like he's in a bad exorcist ripoff movie and then stops being a demon because only demons rape people, I guess, is this is what we can take away from this episode. Questionable. Then they have some sisterly bonding. I feel like Macy still doesn't really gel with the group because they don't have a pre-existing relationship. In like the original Charmed, there was that pre-existing relationship, even though there was estrangement when like Phoebe went away to do Phoebe stuff. Now it just feels like they have nothing in common with Macy. And they don't really, except this whole witch thing. But hopefully that will grow through the series. It was just kind of a weird choice to not have it in the beginning when it's meant to be about sisters. And it's like, well, technically you are sisters, but mostly you're strangers. But the episode isn't over yet, folks, because during the night, Macy can't sleep. So she starts thinking about what White Lighter bloke said about how their mum was murdered and how it was really cold in the house and there were birds. And she identifies the demon that, that killed their mum super fast. She confronts uh, Maggie with this the next day and asks where Mel is. But Mel has already gone to a rally against Professor Vane, which is unfortunate because he is the demon. And I think we all knew that. At the rally, Mel notices that her breath is coming out in like white plumes, even though no one else's is. But she freaks out, correctly assumes that it's a demon somehow, and then runs into the lab, which is where Professor Vane is. Vane or Vane? Whichever, he's there. Um, also, the guy who she punched in the nose is there. His name is Cameron. I sincerely hope we never see him again. But he, but Professor Vane then reveals himself to be an ice demon in terrible CGI. Like, it doesn't look cheap or weird. It just looks weird because he's an entirely CGI thing in a room of things that are not CGI. It just looks weird. And I feel like it's always better when you, like, augment the reality as it is than just plopping a massive CGI thing in there because it just doesn't look great. But anywho, apparently he's a demon who drains the strength from strong women. There goes that mallet again. And uh, he accidentally shoots Cameron with an icicle, which I guess is pretty funny. Uh, and then Harry is called in to really reluctantly heal Cameron. I kind of like his sarcastic British apathy, uh, as opposed to like the original White Lighter, like Leo's kind of puppy dog eyed sincerity. Because he just kind of like waves his hand at him like, oh, this fucking guy going to have to heal his murderedness. Um, but that was that was pretty entertaining. In fact, most of the good lols come from Harry, to be honest. Anyway, they do the whole power of three thing and the ice demon goes bye bye, but not before he says it has begun and implies that he wasn't the one who actually killed their mum. So I, I guess that research Macy did was wrong, but they don't really talk about that at the end of the episode. Uh, they then move Macy into their house, which seems premature, but OK. And they dig out the old Ouija board because uh, Macy had this story that when she was nine at a birthday party sleepover, she thought that her mum, who she thought was dead, was communicating to her through a Ouija board. And they're like, well, I mean, if mum was a witch, maybe she was. So they play with the Ouija board and it spells out, don't trust Harry. And then Harry appears to be like, you called? Which I thought was an interesting move because it kind of shows that maybe you can't trust the white lighter guy which i think was kind of a plot point in the early series of charmed when leo was just pretending to be their handyman and he would occasionally do supernatural stuff that they didn't see but i think it's more implied now uh, so that's an interesting idea overall 
I don't think it's terrible. The original Charm series was already a bit cheesy in places. It was kind of like just campy, cheesy, good fun. And it's only when it started to take itself really seriously that it got into a, a little bit of trouble with being unintentionally ridiculous. Unfortunately, that's sort of what this series is doing. There's still like the cheesy good fun of like, oh, we're witches and there's demons and we're still grounded enough in the real world to talk about how ridiculous that is. But at the same time, I really hope the really heavy handed feminism is something that gets dropped after the pilot and it was just really amped up in the pilot to give you a sense of the characters and who they are. Because otherwise, it's painful to watch. I say this as someone who is a feminist and like, I agree with everything the show is trying to espouse. But at the same time, there's such a thing as subtext and there's such a thing as characterization, And that is not just having characters bandy pro-choice slogans at each other back and forth. For instance, there's kind of a nice moment where what Cameron was talking about before he got punched in the nose was that the whole Angela Professor Thane thing was he said, she said, and there was no real proof. And then at the end, Harry's like, we should wipe this guy's memory because otherwise he knows you're witches. And they're like, nah, because it's kind of a he said, she said thing. And there's three of us and only one of him. So that's still a little bit blatant, but it is incredibly subtle compared to some of the other shit that went down in this episode. Like the whole consent talk thing, like why is that even here? Why are we doing this to ourselves? Because I feel like there's no point in that being there because most people who are watching it are going to be people who are already comfortable watching a show with feminine leads who are powerful. Guys aren't going to be watching this if they, they have a problem with women and need to learn about feminism. So it seems really weird because you can have that like empowerment narrative underneath the surface, but you need to have stuff going on on the surface to distract from it, to make it metaphorical and not just painfully literal. So I'm really hoping that gets dialed down at least 18 notches for the rest of the series, but we'll see. Uh, I'm going to watch the rest of the series and then just do a sort of summing up episode about it. I'm not going to go through it episode by episode because who has the time, quite frankly. But I wanted to get some original like thoughts down, like my first impressions on the series, and we'll see if it gets better or if these issues are resolved when the training wheels come off when we're not in, you know, please pick us for syndication land. Um, and we're more into more settled territory. Obviously, it was renewed, so it kind of been too terrible although they did keep making arrow for a really long time so uh, but they are now making series three as well so i'm hopeful that it as it gets through it becomes a little less shaky like the first series of the original charmed was also a little bit shaky it had a lot of stuff to establish it had to characterize these people and they were kind of annoying caricatures particularly piper but then they kind of calmed down and became a bit more realistic a bit more grounded so hopefully by the time I get to the end of series one, I will be enjoying myself a lot more and not just feeling like I'm watching a remake of something that I really loved, which doesn't quite add enough new good stuff to, to make it a better version or even on par. So we'll get to that. In the meantime, let me know your views on the new Charmed or don't if you are racist. Just going to put that caveat in there because I'm not interested in that view. Uh, you can get in touch in the normal way on Twitter. You can follow me uh, over there or on Instagram at Witchfix Podcast. You can see all kinds of pictures and things. Find out what I'm reading or watching before the episodes go out. So you can, I don't know, stalk me, buy the same book. I don't know. You're weird. Go away. And with that, goodbye. I'll see you in the next one. <laughs> <laughs>